to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it. We have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. It's Power Talk Friday. Today, we have another brand strategist with us on the show, Michelle Clayton. She is a woman behind Let Her Fly, a studio for successful women who are ready to level up and look like the professional they are. This episode is worth a listen whether you are new in business or seasoned because Michelle not only is giving us tips on how to think of our brand at the beginning, but also if we're interested or in need of a rebrand as well. A lot of what Michelle and I talk about today are things that you probably have heard on the show before. I know that we've had several discussions about branding with my creative director, Nicole Heimer, the founder of Glory and Brand. She's my website designer. She's my website developer. She's my co-author. And she's all the things. And even so, there are still some aha moments woven into this episode. I promise you. You know, sometimes we just need to hear it a different way from a different person. Okay. One thing you might be guilty that of that Michelle talks about is using Fiverr to design your logo. So before you get all crazy pants about that statement, just hang on and listen to what she has to say about it. She has some other no-nos that she shares with us as well as actionable tips for figuring out a brand that represents us and our business in a way that she says, fits like your favorite t-shirt, okay? With a design degree and 30 years in the industry, Michelle's experience ranges from in-house art departments to nonprofits to two of Calgary's largest advertising agencies. Through Let Her Fly, she now brings that same level of expertise and eye for detail to entrepreneurs and small businesses. Here's what I know. Pinpointing your brand is both incredibly important and challenging. And because of this, every conversation on branding is worth having, even if we just get one more insight, right? And this is exactly why I have invited two of my favorite rock stars to join me on the stage at Luann Live November 2023 to talk about branding. We have the delightful and seriously hashtag smart lady, Rachel Bozick, queued up for a panel discussion with another one of my favorite ladies, Nicole White, an extremely talented designer from South Florida who lives and breathes her brand, in all the ways. You want to be in this room with us to listen to these two ladies talk about the strategies and to ask them the but how questions that you have when it comes to branding. Tickets are on sale now. Please go to luannlive.com to learn more and to grab your seat before it's too late. All right, let's talk to Michelle, shall we? Hey, Michelle, thanks so much for joining me on a well-designed business today. Thank you, Luann. It's so good to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I am too. Um, One of the things, Michelle, that I read in the information and learning a little bit about you and your company was you were talking about when you are rebranding, when you are outgrowing your brand, which I'm going to ask you a little bit about Mm -hmm. too um, in a moment, but you said don't go scrolling Pinterest to figure out what the new brand should feel like or what your brand should feel like or be like. And I, you know, I, what I want to say is, well, I guess that makes sense, but I don't really know enough to know why it makes sense. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. I see. And I say that because that tends to be the first place people go, especially women that if they're starting to feel like something's off with their visual brand, their brand identity, Mm. 
for some reason, Pinterest or now Instagram as well, or they might start stalking their competitors, like going on Google and seeing, well, what is everybody else doing out there? That tends to be a default place where people go. And it's actually kind of the worst place to go <laughs> because <laughs> it, well, number one, it muddies the water. It's just really confusing when you start seeing all this stuff and you can't filter what you're looking at. But it's also the wrong approach as we talk about brand strategy and where you want to start when it comes to rebranding, which is not the visual piece, ironically. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm, of course, already hearing Nicole Heimer in my head, Glory and Brand, yep. right? Because yep. um, she has taken me through many brand exercises. So I feel like, oh, I just went, oh, I think I know. But tell us, what is the first place that we need to go as opposed to the visual piece? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first place is that strategy piece. And like it or not, the biggest component of that strategy really comes down to language. And, and that's why when we're when we're caught in Pinterest world and we're looking at visual pieces, we forget about the language and defining language around who we are, who our clients are, how we want to be known, how we want to be perceived as business owners. Um, like you say, decide to be excellent. Like we want to be excellent businesses and that comes through in our visuals as well or not. Right. Mm. So when we start with the language piece, we get much clearer and much less distracted by what else is going on around us. So, like I said, it's hard for me not to recall the process that Nicole mm -hmm. has walked me through in doing this. And to your point, I remember her actually saying, like, what are your words? What are the things that you do? And and we went all through it's straight talk, it's straight talk and it's action and it's yep. not fluff. And it's like, get to business, you know, like what, you know, I don't want to putz around. I want to talk about the pretty. Yep. I don't want to talk about the pretty. I expect you to do a pretty room. Talk to me about how you make the pretty happen in the background. Right. right. So, so for me, that was um, very clear. Mm -hmm. Like, I was in business at that point, 35 years. And when she started pounding me with and grilling me with questions, like things were coming to mind right away. But I got to wonder, um, I never had the opportunity for somebody to explore what a brand would look like when I, we were only in business three or five years. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, as a matter of fact, if anybody remembers the episode with Kay Whitaker back in the beginning, probably the first six months of the podcast, I was like, oh, that's a brand. I'm like, oh, we have a brand at Window Works. We just didn't know it was a brand, right? Exactly. And Everyone so, has one. Right. Like you just didn't know about yeah. it. So how do you help your clients and how do you suggest designers listening that haven't been through the process and don't know the questions to ask and how do they sift through. Like I said, I 35 years in business at the point, I was clear on my answers, mm -hmm. but I don't know that I would have been if I were only a five or a two or a three year entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Right. right? And, and it often, I will say to that too, Luann, it often takes a few years to get that kind of clarity, right? Like you mm -hmm. this many years in, you've got it down pat, right? But it, there is a there is a period of time at the beginning for new owners where they're still figuring things out. You're still mm -hmm. trying different types of clients, right? And trying to, to see, okay, who do I really want to work with or who resonates with me better and, and who appreciates my work better. Um, and that does take time and that's okay. Like that's what I want people to hear is that you don't have to, you know, day three of your business, be able to answer every question that a designer is going to ask you. You won't be able to. Very rarely. I, I won't say never, but it's pretty rare for people to know that right out of the gate. Um, and that's fine. You just need to spend that time with the people you love to work with, with a team that you love to work with, and really getting clear on that. And that's where we ask a lot of questions around. Um, it, it comes into what's your experience? What's your education? What's your personality? Um, what are your unique kind of life experiences that you bring to the table, your, your perspective on things that other designers, there's a lot of designers out there, right? But they all approach it a little bit differently. So what's your kind of sweet spot in that mm. and getting clear on that. And then the flip side of that is getting clear on who your audience is. And that's the piece that really takes longer. You know, we, we kind of know who we are as, as adults, you know, unless we're really young starting, you know, we know who we are and how we want to show up as a business owner, but taking the time to know who are the clients that you work best with that you just have to work with them, right? You have to work with enough of them to know, 
um, what those general characteristics are for your people. You know what's interesting? I, I, I mean, we we've, we've probably had a dozen conversations on brand mm-hmm. here over the seven mm-hmm. years, right? And I know that this has been said, but this is exactly proves my point that you you can never say, oh, that's a topic on branding. I don't need to listen to that. I've heard her talk about that five other times because I just had an aha moment. Like while Yay. you were talking, Yay. like it's crazy. <laughs> and Nicole's going to kick my butt. She's going to be like, seriously, Lou, I told you that a thousand times, right? right? Like, like, but the thing is what you just said, all of a sudden the connection happened for me. And what you said is in the beginning, you're still figuring out who are the clients that you want to work with? Which are the projects are the ones you want to work with? And I just heard the end of the sentence, which is, and how can you possibly start to lean into your brand identity if you haven't figured that out first? Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you, it's like, woo, you're like, okay, sort of obvious. Right. But what I'm going to say is I guarantee you that there have been new designers that have listened to this show over the seven years that have one day listened to a show on branding Mm -hmm. and went, okay, so I have to figure out my brand and literally spent time trying to do it. Mm -hmm. And then a different day, listen to a show about who your ideal client is or, you know, catering your services to your ideal client and thinking they're figuring out that as a separate pillar, like it's a separate thing. Uh, And I just got it that one doesn't come until the other is decided. Yeah. They really do work together. Yeah. Yeah. Like, of course they do. Like if you're like, we say all the time, oh, she's, you know, the interior designer that works with busy families with 16 kids and 40 dogs. Right. (laughs) But like, it's more than that. Mm -hmm. And it's not until you really figure out that not every single prospective client with a busy house with kids and pets actually fits you. Right. It's that's not enough. Right. Right. And so that was a pretty decent aha moment there, Michelle. Oh, I gotta nice. tell you. <laughs> nice. And I would add, it's not enough and it's okay. Like it, right. it's okay, right? It's okay to have a specific type of client that you really love working with. And maybe you'll work with some others that aren't perfect, perfect fit, but that's okay for you to, to take the time to sort that out. And it, right, it right, will right. yield you a much better future if you take the time to do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And to your point, it does take time to mm-hmm. sort it out. I mean, even when I think about the journey with Window Works, you know, right now Window Works is fully, you know, high end. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're not coming for a bargain. That's all I'm telling right. you. You know, you're not like, hey, I want to compare you to the box store. Like, good for you. Have a great day. <laughs> See you. Bye. <laughs> you know what I mean? But in the beginning, I, I mean, I've told the story before about when the first time we had a custom client that we had done some work for. And then she wanted to do a second room and she wanted that room to be shutters. And we were only in business maybe a year or two. Mm -hmm. And when I gave her the quote for the shutters, which is a high ticket item for window treatments, Mm -hmm. you know, she just was like, that's insane. I was like, well, right. Cause the other windows, we did mini blinds. I mean, it was the eighties. That was when mini (laughs) blinds were the range, you know, and they were like $50 a window, you know, and the shutter at the time was probably three, $400 a window, Mm -hmm. which was insane. Now you can't even get a mini blind for 300 a window for crying out loud. But the point was that when she said, thanks, no thanks, then she called back and she said a couple days, whatever later. And she said, you know, we found them ready-made basically in Mm -hmm. packages Mm -hmm. over at the box store. If I buy them, will you send your installer to put them up? And I remember going to Vinny and asking him and he was like, well, yeah, charger, you know, $75 a window or whatever, which seemed like so much money at the time. And Billy was there like 10 hours installing like four windows. And it was, oh my God. And it was the lesson learned for us that when somebody pays you to do something, they expect a much level, much higher level of expertise and a much better outcome than if her husband was screwing them to the windows and they were all cockeyed and all the things. And the second thing was, is not everybody's your customer. Like, you know, she could be my customer 
in her primary, the living room where she was spending money, but in these upstairs little bedrooms, extra rooms where she didn't value them price wise, Mm -hmm. she wasn't our customer. And to your point, that's that process that you go through and you figure out mm-hmm. who you're and and now at this point, when somebody says, I want to do something really inexpensive in this room, it's like, well, well, what do we mean by really inexpensive, mm-hmm. sweetie? Mm-hmm. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's still gonna be somewhat expensive if you have us there, yes. you know. So um, I, I appreciate that, that you really do go through those ropes as a new entrepreneur and figure out what works for you and what does it. Yes. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. And then that's how you start the conversation in your head of like, and then how do I translate this into words to your, your second step, right? It was like, first it's the strategy. Who do I want to speak to? Mm-hmm. And then it's, what is the language that I use? Exactly. Right? Exactly. And I, and I think people hesitate to start there too, because it feels hard for most people. I feel like getting clear on the language. When I, when I'm working with people, I tell them just brain dump, like literally just get the words on the page that describe, Mm. you know, who you are and who your people are and what do you want to be known for and all those kinds of things. It doesn't have to be this fancy, you know, columns on a spreadsheet or anything like that. Just get it out on paper. And then you can start to see the patterns, see the themes that keep coming to the surface or see ideas that you're like, oh, I said this five times. Great. You said that five times. That means it's probably really important to you (laughs) or it's really important to your audience, right? So let all that stuff come out and then you can start to sift through it, categorize it and, and prioritize it really. So that might be you as the business owner that can do that, or you hire someone else and they help you go through that process as well. Right. Yeah. Right. I love it. I love it. You know, there was another thing that you wrote down that intrigued me and you said, why, like, so this is, if you're looking at you and you, you're maybe new in business and you're starting to gel right now your thoughts are starting to gel and you're starting to get some clients that are feeling like your ideal client and why your Fiverr or your DIY (laughs) logo isn't working for you anymore. So what is the deal with that? Do you have people that push you back and say, well, I don't think it looks bad. Like who said it was made on Fiverr just because it was $45? How, why do you think it like, Hey, yeah, like, how do you, like, what is, what is the, I guess, what are the qualities, what is the hallmark that, what is the difference between a Fiverr one and a professionally made one? Mm-hmm. The hallmark between them. And fortunately, the, most of the women that I work with, in fact, I'd say all of the women I work with, I don't get pushback from them on that. They will come, it doesn't come out till later. It's like, yeah, I got that logo done on Fiverr or yeah, my assistant made it on Canva or whatever. They know that it's, it ain't working anymore, right? Okay. Um, but what happened is it goes back to that strategy piece. And when they started out, you know, you contact Fiverr. That's why Fiverr is so cheap. They don't spend time <laughs> developing a brand strategy and writing a creative brief and all of that. They just said, okay, she said her favorite color is this, and this is the industry she's in. And so they put together some pieces and voila, there you have your your, your logo or your fonts or whatever, right? right. So yeah. it just goes back to that strategy. They don't, take the time because you're not paying them for their time to be strategic in it. They just want something that looks nice and it looks nice, but it's not solving a bigger problem of how you want to be perceived in your industry. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, and what do you do when you work with people to develop a logo? What are the, you know, so you have your brain dump and you start to get your language and all of that. And then, you know, what are some of the things that you do think about when it finally comes time to designing that logo? Yeah, what we think about is what are the responses to all those questions, right? So there's a pretty intensive intake questionnaire on my part. Um, And the fun thing is that, and and then we meet. So we'll meet on Zoom and and have, you know, further discussion of, okay, you said this and this and this. Tell me more about that. Or how does this show up in your business? Or, you know, this is what you did before. This is what you're doing. All those kinds of things come out. And a common theme is they say, I gave you all this information and it didn't even make sense to me. I don't know how you make sense of all this stuff, right? They feel, they really do feel like they just kind of brain dumped on the page. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's sifting through that. And I think a lot of times, Luann, it really just, it takes a third party perspective, Mm. right? And that's true with lots of things, right? Not just branding. You just need an outsider, to look in and, and it's, it just feels easy for me to see the themes, to see the priorities, to see what they're really amazing at that they don't give themselves credit for. Right. Mm, yeah. 
that's what comes out. And so once we get clear on that language then and develop the brand strategy document, which in an ad agency world would be a creative brief, but that's what we're composing for them, then the visuals and the logos, fonts, colors, all of that comes out of that strategy document. Mm. Mm-hmm. And that's your background, right? Is working, yeah. was it, did I, did I read that, that you work from an advertising background? Yeah, I have a pretty varied background. I've done all kinds of things. I've worked nonprofit, I've worked in-house, but um, my previous corporate career before I started this endeavor was in the ad agency world. Yeah. And it was mm. such a gift to be able to approach it from that perspective Whereas had I not had that perspective, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing branding that way now, but it works. Like it's, it's like magic. It really does work. (laughs) Yeah. So I feel like I got an inside track that I get to move into smaller businesses and give them the same benefit that the big companies get. Mm, Yes. And, and you see that it makes a big difference, Mm -hmm. doesn't it? When, Mm -hmm. when a company takes the time and invests the time and the money in, um, doing this work and then creating the collateral that comes from the work, right? Right. Right. Yeah. And, and the, the biggest, I'd say the biggest place I see it show up is in their confidence. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Once they have, if they've gone through a rebrand process or some of them, you can't even really call it a rebrand. It's just a new brand um, out of the DIY phase. Their confidence changes so significantly and they're willing to show up differently be more visible. And that's where the growth comes from, right? Once you're more visible in your business, that's how your business really grows. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that um, newer business owners, their confidence literally quadruples, you know, all of the things when they get their back end systems down. Yes. All of a sudden it's like, yeah, this is what I charge. You know, I don't, you know, take it or leave it. But I didn't know that the same thing has, that there's such a dramatic difference when you get your branding down too. Yep. Absolutely. That's what they tell me. And I, and I saw it myself when I rebranded a couple years into my own business, it's like, okay, now I look like the expert that I am. I knew what I was doing before, but it, it just wasn't reflected visually in how I was representing my business. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we talk about, you know, this process, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm just going to ask it. Is there, is it, is it, there's a DIY to this? I mean, somebody listening that isn't, you know, I always say in the show, you're going to spend time or money, right? Yeah. So is there an ability to do this with just spending your time or is it really take that engagement with a professional? Like, I don't know how you would do it without somebody else looking at you going good, bad, not good, you know, keep moving. That's silly. <laughs> yeah, I don't. But of course, I don't have a lot of radar for that stuff, though, either. So Yeah, but you <laughs> totally know the visual aesthetic, just in a different field, Luann. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't see people do it well very often. Yeah. Um, right. Usually they've done the DIY visually and they know that it's not representing them well. So the Mm -hmm. DIY on their part becomes, okay, I need to gather the information. I need to be able to communicate clearly about my business and my audience because I can't make that up for you. Like if you've hired me as a designer, you have to be able to give me, you're the expert in your business and I'm going to come in as the brand expert to support you in that. Mm -hmm. So there is that piece, like even the intake form, I have clients say, Michelle, I I warned them, but they're like, it took hours. Like it takes them several hours to really pull out all that information. And usually there's a big, thank you for making me think about this. I never Mm. thought about my business this way, but it makes so much sense now that I've taken the time to do that. And and then they also have a whole bunch of information for social media posts and newsletters and like content that they're going to create comes from those conversations as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so funny because I can't unhear the line that Nicole wrote in the Power Talk Friday expert. She's like, pour a glass of wine and let's sit down and have a date with your brand tonight. And like, just go through it because to your point, it's, it is very introspective and there's no, there's no straight line through it. I mean, it doesn't need to be a difficult process. It yeah. doesn't need to be something you don't enjoy, yeah. but it isn't like, Hey, let me just rattle it off on a phone message while I'm on the way to pick up the kids at the car, you know, at the park no. or whatever. It's like, you got to think about it, right? Yeah. You do have to take some time to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you also um, mentioned to me about, um, 
you know, like you look, you you talked about a brand that fits like their favorite t-shirt, right? Mm -hmm. And attracts more of the ideal clients mm -hmm. that they want. So we do this work. Um, and, and I hear you, the steps are putting a strategy in place, figuring out the language and making sure, are there other things that you suggest that go along with this process so that it does feel like your favorite t-shirt? From the client perspective, not really. Like okay. the, the majority, if you want to consider that like input labor on their part, it really mm -hmm. does happen at that beginning phase. Okay. And then once we've okay. got that nailed down, I find that the, the graphic approval process, right? The back and forth of logos and all of that comes right. very easily. And it's a very quick response of, yes, we're right on track, or mm, maybe we need to tweak this a little bit and we need to make some adjustment. It feels a little bit too much like this. And I'd, I'd really like to feel a little more like that, whatever that might be. Um, so there's not like, there's not a, a huge um, time energy mm -hmm. commitment beyond that first part. That's when you get into that, the fun stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what everyone yeah. wants to see. They're like, turn this into something beautiful, please, for me. And like, I would love to do that for you. And and, and it right. comes out of that. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever, have you ever had situations because designers are highly creative, clearly, obviously, duh, right? And um, capable of creating beautiful things. Um, it seems to me that like you work across different industries, so you're not strictly working with interior designers. And I feel like it would probably almost be harder working with interior. Like part <laughs> of me feels like it would be easier because they might be able to actually visualize a feeling or a look that they want to represent mm -hmm. rather, you know, over a CPA would. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I feel like they're going to be much more critical of what you're like, this is what I heard when you spoke. And they're like, nah, that's not what I look like. Like, uh, do you, like, does that, is it easier across other industries? I'm just curious. I haven't found a difference with industries. No. I, maybe, you know, I have worked with some financial consultants and that are much more left brain thinking, and maybe there is a quicker approval on their part, but I don't like, none of them are difficult. Like, no, no, they're all okay. pretty trusting of the process and, and very much on board with how it, how it all forms out. Yeah. And when you've taken the time to go through the whole discovery and the whole getting to know them, have you ever put back at somebody your ideas and suggestions? And they were just like, that doesn't feel like me. I mean, does that happen? Not really. That's no, good. I mean, yeah, I can think of good. one or two clients over the years that there was more pushback from, but those were the clients who really weren't clear on their own business. Mm -hmm. And so it, mm -hmm. it, if you, and that's why it's a little risky to work with a brand new business because you increase those odds of there being a disconnection right. there because they just, they don't know. And usually it's a, they want to be all things to all people, which we all know that we can't be right. And so it's like, yeah, yeah but if I go this direction, then I'm kind of leaving out these people. I'm like, yes, yes, you are. Yeah, and that's, that's okay. That's the point of what we're doing here, yes. sweetie. <laughs> yes. But that's a hard pill for some people to swallow. So mm -hmm. Once they've been in business for a few years, it's usually not a problem, no. And it's interesting, too, because there are clients, regardless of the industry, who do have a better, I don't know, design sense or a better better eye for visuals and aesthetics. And mm -hmm. the fun thing is when all of that aligns. And they're like, I kind of had this in mind, but I didn't want to tell you because I didn't yeah. want to influence your decisions. And then what you come to them with is very much in line with what they had in mind. That's, oh, really that's, fun. Fun. that's really fun. That's really fun. Yeah. Yeah. That is fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I found it interesting going through the process, the level that, um, you know, Nicole and I'm sure yourself go down into, like you mentioned the fonts mm -hmm. and the colors and things like that. It's like just why you would pick one font over another is just crazy. And I guess recalling the process for me, it wasn't like, I mean, what you do as an expert is you do your whole thing and then you present like two or three. It's just like an interior designer, right? Mm -hmm. They're not going to say there's 5,000 different sofas that will fit in this space, right? Yes. And so, but I just found it interesting that each selection, each option 
had a reason. Mm -hmm. That was my experience with her. And I'm sure it's the same with what you do with your clients, right? It's like, I'm thinking of this for your buttons. I'm thinking of this for your font. And these are the reasons why. And I just was like, it's a font. Like, that's crazy. (laughs) (laughs) But at the same time, you have a reaction to a font. And I'd be like, you're right. That one is dumb. Like, that doesn't feel like me. Like, what? how can I feel like a font? Yeah. But you can. You can. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's weird. Like, you know, it's funny because like, silly things, like if it's too curly Q or too girly, like right now, I actually have pink nail polish on. Like, baby pink nail polish. And it is like, what are you doing with that right now? Like it literally. And the thing is, I was going to a baby shower and I was like, oh, it's spring. Let me just do this. And I like, the person was like, as soon as I walked into the nail salon, they were like, you you know, you you pick the color. Right. And I was like, okay. And so I was like, I didn't want to stand there and like take a hundred hours to pick a color. And I just went, Oh, that's, that's a pretty pink. That's like, you know, a baby shower. It's bright and it's breezy and it's summery. And I was like, but it's not you. I'm like, it's nail polish. It can be you. (laughs) And and so I put it, I I gave it to him. And literally with the first stroke, I'm like, that is so not me. And this looks so stupid. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, It was so funny. And when I got back, then he said to me, he goes, oh, your nails look good. I go, they look ridiculous. I look like I'm 12. Oh, no. (laughs) But it's nails. You can just get them redone. That's it, right? But that's the thing. It's like so funny how certain things are just this. There's nothing unattractive about this polish. It's not like, oh, my God. And I could see it on 20 other people and actually admire it. But I'm walking around going, whose fake polish are you wearing? Like, this doesn't feel like you, right? <laughs> it's like someone else's <laughs> hands are attached to the end of your body. <laughs> you know, And I think that's what it is, right, Michelle? When you are putting your brand out there in front of people and every part of it has to just feel like yep. you, not yeah, but, right? A hundred percent. And that's what I hear over and over again. It feels like me. It fits yeah. me. Or it doesn't, right? When they come to me, it's like, right. it just doesn't fit me anymore. It doesn't feel like right. me anymore. I've I've grown. I've evolved. I'm a bigger expert than I was five, 10 years ago. And they don't like that disconnect feeling. No, None of us do, right? I call it the yeah. ick factor. Like when they're up okay. here and their brand is, you know, up high and their brand is kind of stuck in that DIY fiber phase, that gap right. in between, it's the ick factor. And you just know, yeah. you, you know, when you have it and it's time to do something about it. And by the way, it's so funny because um, I often speak at the IWCE and different places about, you know, attracting the luxury consumer. Mm-hmm. And that is one of the big mistakes that I think any business can make, particularly an interior designer, is when you have crossed over to actually doing more luxury work, Mm -hmm. you actually are that now. You, most of your projects, if not all of them are elevated. And, and, and by the way, some, you know, one person's elevation is another person's. I was there 10 years ago. So it has Mm -hmm. no bearing on the objective, you know, a decor worthy, a a, a D 100 worthy or L decor worthy Mm -hmm. or whatever. Right. It's just your own personal journey of growth is what I think we're talking about. Right. And the thing is, what I always say is, is that if you present yourself in one way in, um, Instagram, which is easy to upgrade and change, but then I go to your website and it is that, that you from two, three, five years ago, Mm -hmm. It's, I, I, I don't, it's a hard stop for me. I'm just like, and, and I'm just inter- looking at you if you're going to be interviewed. <laughs> like, <laughs> this isn't like, I'm going to hire you with for a $300,000 reno project. You know right. what I mean? I, but I, it's a hard stop on the interview. It's like, you pitch me to be on it. And I look at one and I look at the other and they're not lined up unless your pitch is, I'm out here floundering and I'm not sure what to do and things don't line up. And like, I want to talk about how hard it is to do it. Okay, let's do that. But don't tell me who you think you are and you don't show up that way because I don't believe you. Yep. You know? Yeah. It's jarring. It's that, it's like the whiplash thing of, wait a minute, am I even on the right website? Right. I saw you on Instagram and it was beautiful, but it directed me here and that must be the wrong link, (laughs) you know, except the name matches up, but it's people, people need that consistency. 
yes. in their brand yeah. across all platforms, whatever that is for your business. It's the truth. I, I mean, I think that sometimes designers think I just say it to repeat it, but it is a visceral reaction. It is. Like I am literally like, hard stop. Nope. Not, that's, a, that's an N-O. That's an N-O on that pitch. That's an N-O. It's like, this is not lining up. And I, I'm not going to be able to get it out of my head. <laughs> you know, Because what happens is to me, I believe is the same thing that happens to a consumer. It's like, well, what part of what you're saying is the truth and what part isn't? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because these two can't be true. Yeah. You're losing credibility. They're, yeah. You, you literally are. And it's crazy how the visuals are so critical to that. Yeah, they right? are. Yeah. Especially if your business is a visual business, like interior <laughs> design, go. right? Like visuals are everything. Yes, you need to have good copy. Yes, you need to have great photos. But I mean, even the photos are visual stuff. It For yeah. those of us in visual businesses, it's really important. Yeah. And, you know, that's interesting when you talk about copy, because I feel like there are levels of scrutiny, I guess is the mm. word I want to say. So maybe your Instagram matches your website, the look of it, and it feels kind of on point mm -hmm. and that's good. But then there's the next level. So if you're saying I'm Sally Smith and I do interior design and I love your show, Luann, and I wanted to tell people about this great, you know, marketing method that I've used to build my business and you know, I'm a, I'm a regular business, just like window works. I'm a regular business. I'm not internationally known Nate Burkers or Corey Damon, you know, Jenkins or anything. Yeah. You know, what happens now is if you come to me and you tell me who you are and you want to describe that you have a certain level of seasonality in your business, a certain level of seasonness and a certain, certain level of expertise. Now, if the visuals line up, now I start to read the copy. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is the copy can fall off the, off the rails too. For sure. If it's right. If For it's sure. just too basic and it's inspired by the dunes and beaches, <laughs> all clients get all the things that they love because they're amazing for all the things. Like yes. now I'm looking for what I've learned from the people that I've interviewed on the show, the brand experts, Nicole and Kay. And now what I understand is if the copy isn't expressing a point of view and you're telling me you're seasoned, it's like, but are you really? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's right? hard to believe them. Because to your point, like if you're still in that phase of being all things to all people, my brain automatically is, well, how many rodeos have you been to? If you really do think this is how this is done, we're all things to all people. Yes. Right? Exactly. And I think you, you said it really well, Luann, that I feel like copy is kind of the next level. And I think some of that, I was thinking about this recently because there used to be the statistic that you have seven seconds to make a first impression. I don't know <laughs> if it's still seven, maybe we're down to three or four now. Right. I don't know. Right. <laughs> but just think of it when you go to a website, how much copy can you read in seven seconds? Not a whole lot, but how much yeah. visual material can you take in in seven seconds? A oh, whole lot, a lot more. Like you can yeah. swipe Instagram, you can swipe a website and you automatically get that visceral feel that you were talking about. Right. That's and so right. it either, it's either attractive or it's a turnoff. If it's attractive, then you kind of go, like you said, one layer deeper and start reading. Are they the real deal? Do they actually know what they're talking about? Do they have the chops for what they're, what they're mm -hmm. saying that they can do? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and your and to your point, the copy can reveal your experience level, but by the way you talk about a project and about the types of projects you describe. Mm -hmm. But like I said, too, I'm looking at that point for point of view. Mm -hmm. I'm looking mm -hmm. for you to say, this is who I am. This is why I'm this way. This is how I work. This is why I work this way. And these are the people I talk to because yeah. that's powerful, right? It is. It's your own story, right? What's mm -hmm. more powerful than your own story? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because I'm just lit li literally kind of, you know, cataloging in my brain as we're talking, the things that are the red flags when I do mm -hmm. look at designers, you know, it, websites and stuff is another, I feel like a rookie mistake is when you're, you know, look, if you're, you know, Gensler, you know what I mean? You have a hundred designers or however many you have you know, even there, you're going to get the, the, who, our team and here's the architectural team and here's the commercial team and on hospitality team. But 
another kind of what strikes me, and I'm curious your thoughts on it is mm-hmm. when there's no name, it's we, 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 no name, no picture. And it's like, well, we who? Is it you and Queen Elizabeth? Like, who's the we? (laughs) Right? And you don't put your picture there. And you don't say, I am Sally Smith. (laughs) And I am from Iowa. And this is what I do. Right? Yep. That's a pet peeve of mine, too. And like, I, I shouldn't have to look that hard to figure out who this company is what you look like, what your first and last name are. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. You need to make it easy for people and give them the path of least resistance. And mm-hmm. and I agree too on the we thing. I've always been really careful. I say I on my website. Like I hire mm-hmm. subcontractors. I have you know, part-time assistants and things like that, but it's still, I am the primary face of my business and mm-hmm. I'm the one who's going to do your design work and they, people want to know that. Yeah. So, and I'm okay if you're like Laura Umansky or Bria Hamill or, you know, and you've got a team or Martha O'Hara Interiors, you've got a team. Yes. And you say our team and we this, but there's still the principles are still showing up on those, you know, about us pages and a little bit about their story and who they are and why they're the the person running this firm or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's um, the lack of, uh, it just, you know, and, and where you're located, the lack of the name, the lack of the photograph, all of that stuff. It's, uh, and believe me, I know it's a lot. I mean, my goodness, I think, you know, the about us page on window works has a team that was like, you know, half those people don't work there anymore. I'm not saying yeah, it's you got to update that stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not saying it's easy, but yeah. It doesn't, it's just not nobody, right? Like, you know what I'm saying? And we're not getting hired. People aren't coming to us to hire us for an 18 month or two year project. They're looking to us for credibility. Have we done what we've said we can do? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's an in and out, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am type of a thing. But um, it's just, it's just interesting, you know, and are there other things that you can think of, Michelle, that seem to be like the things to make sure to include or the things to, um, you know, be sure to just leave by the wayside, anything come to mind? Mm. One thing that comes to mind when you ask that is um, as far as things to leave by the wayside, and I wouldn't say leave it by the wayside completely, but much more than people typically do is researching their competition. Mm. Because I think that is often what causes a lot of the the insecurity, the comparison, the whatever, all the negative stuff, when you spend so much time looking at who else is, you know, on your level in your industry, whether it's interior design or or something else, and instead of looking at who they are and who their audience is, that's Mm -hmm. the big mistake. It doesn't mean you do need to know, like you need to have some awareness of who they are, but people spend way more time and worry energy on that, Mm. I think, than they need to, for the most part. Mm -hmm. Interesting, Mm -hmm. right? Um, That's interesting. That's interesting because what you're saying is you can get hung up in knots and trying to figure out too much what somebody else is or isn't doing instead of taking the time to just figure out what you do and how you do it. Exactly, exactly. They feel like it's that oversaturated market idea, which... I mean, let's face it, we're all in an oversaturated market, right? There's, exactly. there's, there's tons of people in every industry out there. You know. um, but that's where all the, the negativity comes from around it is when mm. you get stuck looking around instead of looking inside. What they want is they'll say, I want to stand out, right? I want to stand out as an interior designer. I don't want to look like everybody else. Well, the best way to do that is to be yourself, right? right? right to be right, authentic. And you, you. Yes. And you have to know what that is for you and for your people, for your audience. Once you do that, you're going to stand out anyway. Like I've mm-hmm. seen it time and time and time again, that mm-hmm. when you stop worrying about what everybody else looks like and what everybody else's website looks like, and just you just kind of get to think about yourself for a while mm, and focus on yeah. that. And that just yields a much better result. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, you know, look at the principle is the same with interior design, right? If mm-hmm. a designer is working with a client and all the client can do is say, this is my friend's sofa. This is my friend's lamp. This is my mother's, you know, this, Mr. It's like, sweetie, what about your house? What do you want your house to look like? What kind of sofa is comfortable for you? What kind of rug or art speaks to you? Just stop, yeah. you know, right. It's like, yeah. it's like designing for some unknown thing out there as opposed for the person whose home it is. Exactly. 
Exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. right. You get to be a little bit selfish in the process in a good way. <laughs> you don't <laughs> get to way. say that a lot in this world, right? <laughs> no, but it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I remember going through the process with Nicole and literally, Michelle, I think the second meeting I was like, oh, this is like therapy for your business. <laughs> It is. I've had people tell me that. You're like a therapist. Right? I'm like, nobody ever cares as much about it. Like, what do I think of my business? You know, like, you know, because it's like you sit there and you tell you know, I, I, our kids will get together over the weekend, you know, at the beach all summer long. And it's like all I can do to not talk about like the business. I'm just uh, like, they don't care. They don't care. I'm like, oh, I was telling what happened. This great <laughs> interview and this happened. And oh, look, it's like, and I got invited to do that. And I'm just like, shut up. Nobody cares. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so this is the one place when you're trying to identify your brand that you can indulge all your thoughts about your own business, right? Yes. You get to be as selfish as you want to be <laughs> and you get someone to come alongside you that's going to tell you to to do all of those things. Yeah. That's right. You're not going to say, I don't care. No. You're going to say, tell me more. Tell me more. It's always tell me more. Tell me about that. And how did that show up for you? And how did that work out? Yeah. It's super fun. That's right. Super fun. That's right. It's those second and third probing questions Mm -hmm. that I remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dig a little deeper. And it's interesting. It takes you by surprise when you, before the first time you go Mm -hmm. through it, because you're not really accustomed to people actually asking those kinds of questions. But it's, again, I have to liken it to the interior design process. I'm sure when an interior designer is sitting across from somebody and they're asking them about their goals and their ideals and their wishes and their dreams for their home, it's, oh, I like my bedroom to look like a hotel. Tell me about that. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Right? Because that's not enough. Right. What hotel have you you been to recently that made you feel that way? Right, right. Are we talking about the hotel that's like a, you know, like a waterbed over top of like a piling things? Are we talking about the Ritz-Carlton? Like, what are we talking about? Right? So, yeah, yeah, it is an interesting process and it's a worthwhile one Mm -hmm. is the truth. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything? that I didn't ask you about this topic, Michelle, that you think we should cover before we wrap up? Not that I can think of. Yeah. I go back to what you said earlier at the very beginning that everyone's got a brand, right? Even Mm -hmm. if you don't realize it, you've got, you've got one. And the beauty is you can love the one you have and you can keep developing that. Or if it's not working for you, you can always change it. Like you have control. Mm -hmm. You're in control of the situation and you can fix it or whatever you want to call that and make adjustments so that it, does build your confidence and it does help you be more visible or you can just keep adding on to what you have that's already working and take that to the next level so i was gonna let you go now i gotta pick that apart oh no (laughs) (laughs) so so i just want to clarify again because you know i'm a gabillion years down the road yes and so if you're not so many years down the road and you don't have the perspective of being able to actually look from the before you've had these growth opportunities and these hindsights. I think when we spend, you know, a half hour talking about, do you be you? Mm -hmm. And then you say, Hey, if your brand isn't working for you, you can switch it. Mm -hmm. I just want to clarify. We're not saying now decide to be Sally Jones instead of Sally Smith. We're just saying, I'm going to say what my experience is. And you tell me what you, if it's the same or build on it and clarify, but it's like, You uncover layers Mm -hmm. of yourself as you grow as an entrepreneur, and then you find out out that certain of those layers and those uh, ah ahas about yourself serve you better. Yes. And so to uncover and lead with those more, right? So it's not, we're not all of a sudden becoming somebody different and changing it. Right. So you talk about it with your work. Yeah. You're, I would agree with that a hundred percent. You're becoming more of who you are really. Mm-hmm. And you're bringing more of that into your brand and your brand identity. Because what you started with, if you started like, let's just say with the Fiverr logo, it wasn't you, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. That probably wasn't really an accurate representation of you. It worked at the time and it's completely a hundred percent fine to start that way, but that wasn't really bringing you to the table. So as mm-hmm. you uncover more of those layers, like you said, you just get to bring more and more and more of that into your business, which just feels, mm-hmm. feels amazing. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about window works again. I remember when, you know, I had the aha moment on the show with Kay. You have to go back and listen to that. I will. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's a brand. Ah, we have one of those. <laughs> right? And the thing is, what I understood was, my aha was, and I'm going to share it for a newer business owner now, because um, they probably haven't listened to, you know, the show from seven years ago. But it was that I understood when she was explaining about a company's brand that at that point I was like, oh, if Window Works, if we were to say it had a brand, it would be that it is based in integrity mm -hmm. and customer service. Mm -hmm. Like it's those two things. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened was when you talk about leaning into it and you talk about like uh, uh, jiggering it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It was exactly at that point when I had that interview, Window Works was 35 years in business, right? And what I realized was that there was a point, like from day one, we exhibited and we lived in integrity and customer service. That was from day one. But then I was in the conversation with Kay, I was like, oh, there was a point at about eight or 10 years in that I adopted the tagline for Window Works, experience, expertise, excellence. Mm. And I said to my husband, this goes on every piece of literature that we do. Mm -hmm. Every ad, every, you know, gift card, every, everything. Mm -hmm. And he was like, he, he was like, he always is. Whatever, Lou, whatever you want to do is fine. <laughs> like he just <laughs> never got that part of anything. He was like, I don't know why it matters. I'm like, and I couldn't have told you why I knew it mattered. There's just things you do by instinct, yes. right? And the thing was, that was that, you know, now, you know, 20 year later conversation with Kay, I was like, oh, we just became more of what we always were. And we started calling it out in our advertising, in our messaging, in our website. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the transformation. It's yes. not that you change it. It's just that you recognize what really was your core beliefs or mm -hmm. something or your core values as a company. And then you figure out, and to your point, the confidence, yes. the confidence to say, no, experience, expertise, excellence. That's yes. us all day. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. usually, it usually shows up as a leveling up we say, yeah. right? Like you, you're yeah. just taking everything to the next level. Once you've got that kind of clarity, clarity, when you can boil it down to three words, you're on the right yeah. track. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was, I, I remember we were driving on LBI and that I just, I was like, Oh, it just hit you like three words. That's three, that's three great words. I'm like, we're those words. Those are our words. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah. and all through our marriage and our business, things like that. He's just like, whatever. <laughs> okay. You want to use those three words, use those three words. <laughs> but it works. It works. And it, it feels does. good, right? It feels, it's that, it feels like me and it fits me. It fits our company. That's right. That's right. And I have to say, you know, the other added benefit of clarity in your branding and your messaging is when you onboard new employees. Mm -hmm. Like it's part of my spiel. We are here to exemplify experience, expertise, and excellence. This is what you set out every day to do because I'm putting in every blasted piece of advertising that that's what we are. So you better be it. You, you know? better be holding up your end of the deal. <laughs> it's like, I'm telling them that's what we are. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Oh my God. And of course you, you can't live up to it every time, but if you don't have something to try and live up to, then what's the, what, then you really can't get there. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate this conversation, you know, oh, like you. I, I love when I get my aha moment, I get one to show at least I love it when I get it right in the beginning. It's very <laughs> exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but um, thank you. And then you have, I think, a download that people can get. I think I remember seeing, is there something that you wanted to share? Yeah. Or should I just put it in the show notes? You can put it in the share notes, but I would say if people want to, whether it's follow me or there's some free resources they can download, any of those things, get in touch with me. Easiest way is to go to my website. They go to weletherfly.com slash podcast. And it's like a choose your own adventure. <laughs> you can pick from all kinds of things in there, ways to get a hold of me. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I love it. Well, thanks for joining me today, Michelle. Thank you, Luann. I appreciate it. All right. So I want to first talk about this little conversation about fiber. I know many of us have been in that position where we have reached out to Viver to do something for us. And if you're like me, it didn't end well. 
not with something as big as coming up with a logo or something that is going to be part of your actual brand that you present to the world. I remember when I was first um, getting all the ducks in the row for the podcast and I went to Fiverr for a logo, the podcast icon that you've got to put up for um, Apple, you know what I'm saying? And here was the big difference. It was as Michelle discussed, the Fiverr artists are talented, no question. You can't take that away from them, but they are executing what you are asking to do. And I don't know, what did I know about branding? <laughs> like, like seriously, right? I knew about window treatments. I knew about how to run a business. I didn't know anything about branding. Okay. And so when you go to Fiverr, you're like, make a thing that looks like this. When you go to a professional, they do, as Michelle described, is they ask you all the questions. We've had the conversations with both Nicole and Rachel, Rachel on the show as well, getting to know the client. That's what a professional does. You know this process. You do the same thing when you design rooms. You don't meet somebody and have them say, okay, I want one sofa here. I want one area rug there. I want a standing lamp there. I want a bookcase there. And you go, okay, here it is. No. And that is what happens when you work with Fiverr, right? Like there are a thousand places to use Fiverr. I believe, I promise you, I'm not against Fiverr. What I'm saying is something this important, this needs that conversation, right? You need someone who is asking you, who are you? What do you stand for? Who are your clients? How do you want to be perceived as a business owner? Okay. I said to you during the episode, when I work with Nicole, it's like business therapy, right? She's constantly digging in saying, well, what's your objective here? What do you want the outcome to be? What do you want the person on the other end of this to think about, feel about when they see it? Okay. So these are, you know, this is the differentiating point between that. Okay. So, um, you know, and when you do it and look, I get it. We all have to do the things when we get to them, when we can afford them, we do the best with what we can always 100%. But you know, the moment, you know, the moment when it's time for your brand that goes to the world to match up with what you are inside as a designer, you know, that moment only you can establish that moment, but you know it. And what I'm wondering now is, have you passed it? Have you continued to go with something that isn't necessarily up to your, what you're delivering professionally? Does it look like that? If you've been in any live workshop with me, you know, I'm constantly saying, if you come up to me and say, I'm a luxury designer, but I never get luxury clients. I want to see your website. That's the first thing I want to do, right? I want to see what your brand messaging says. Because if you say to me, oh, yeah, but I didn't update that yet. Well, no, <laughs> no wonder you're not getting the calls. So there is a chicken and an egg. We always have to spend money to make money. We do. You have to invest in yourself. Okay, so and branding is such a leading thing. It is. Listen to me. I've said it to you a thousand times. If I just went, I'll tell you the truth. I'll tell you what happened. Two weeks ago, I wanted to learn and find more international interior designers to start interviewing on the podcast. I spent three hours on Instagram Googling interior designer Germany, interior designer Milan, interior designer blah, blah, blah. And I'm not going just by your, your Instagram. Now I'm going over to your website because your Instagram can look like amazing. But if your website does not, then I know you're not serious. Period. That's it. You're not ready for me yet. Okay. You could be a serious person on your way and I want you to get there. But when you tell me, yourself, the man in the corner that I'm not connecting with luxury clients and I'm not sure what it is, you've got to give this a thought. It's critically important. And that's why I consistently put these experts in branding in front of you because someone has to resonate with you. Some message has to get through to you. And this is the one of the key steps to opening that door to that type of business that you want to do. Okay. All right. So I hope that you will join me in Orlando, in Florida, where you can meet 
Nicole Heimer in real life. You can meet uh, Rachel Bozick in real life. You can have a conversation with Nicole White, who, my goodness, lives her brand. I mean, I just admire this woman from head to toe, um, not only for the caliber of the interior design work that she does, but the smart way that she runs the business, the back end of her business, but also how she presents on brand, on point every time I see her in print, in person, all the ways. Okay. Um, so, so join us in Orlando. You can have more conversations about this. If you're not sure about it, these women will be there. And of course, reach out to Michelle as well at Let Her Fly. You know, maybe she's the person that is supposed to be the one to help you. Okay. Thank you tons for listening today. I love it that you join me. Decide to be excellent. Thank you for joining me today. This podcast is a production of Luann Nigara Inc. If you want to know more about me, my books, or Luann University, go to luannnigara.com. And if you are interested in having Window Works help you with your next window treatment or awning project in the New York, New Jersey metro area, go to windowworksnj.com to learn more. Have an excellent day.